Peter was one of the founding members of the Gatekeeper Trust and um, has always provided a profound wisdom and, uh, and vision for the Trust. Um, and Peter is a geomancer. He's many things. He's a philosopher and a geomancer. And he is going to tell us about the wisdom in the land on a big scale. I think that's fair to say. Yes. Thank you, Peter. Peter Dawkins. Well, hello. I can just about see some of you through the, the glare of the lights. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's lovely to be with you. I'm, I do apologise for only doing this one talk instead of the two I was going to give originally. But I, I hope you'll be happy with my one talk <laughs> I'm going to give. And if I can, I'm going to bring a bit in about the gatekeeper, as I would have mentioned tomorrow. Um, but the wisdom in the land. Um, I don't know what you think about it, but to me it's a passion, actually. I get very passionate about it. And um, it's always called me, I think, as a child. Although I didn't know what was calling me then. Um, but I woke up to it really when I was at university and, and um, as an architect went out to researching stone circles and things like that because I wanted to understand why they were positioned where they were and other things you know, in those days. This, this is back in the early 60s. I'm getting a bit old, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, at that time, not a lot of research was done on these things. Um, so I didn't have books and things to look at. I just had to find out for myself in the land. And it was a wonderful, wonderful exploration I found. And, um, and gradually woke up to various things. And, and the first thing I, I really noticed is that what calls you is, is an inner voice, isn't it? But it's actually the land. The land calls you. Certain places call you. Um, and then they start to teach you. I find it's that they start to teach you. And there was this one magic moment. I walked out into the landscape, and um, suddenly you could see things too, which were not physical. And um, so it's not just an inner voice, the land speaking to one, but it was also providing a vision of how things were working, and the movement of energies. And, and um, I even saw, at the early stage, even saw chakra systems and so on in the land. But I didn't understand it, you know, didn't properly understand it. So that, that was the kind of start of my other education. <laughs> so I started as an ordinary architect, really, and um, then became a different sort of architect, uh, a more visionary one. And I uh, still think of myself as an architect, because I like the idea of the description of God as the grand architect of the universe that designs all things through his or her wisdom, the word, the wisdom that underlies all things. And so that, that's why I really want to talk about it in this talk and some of my own experiences and what, what's been discovered, what I'm working on very much now with many other people and what I think is of, of urgency right now and some things that might make sense of the um, different events that are going on in the world. Um, some of them seem very dangerous events, and some of them are very wonderful events. Um, so I thought let's start off by, in a bit of a more philosoph philosophical way, you know, what do we mean when we talk about the wisdom? Well, it is, it is a voice that calls, it is a voice that teaches. It's, it's, an, it's the voice that, if you like, comes out of nowhere, but it, it's associated with the land, or it's associated with behind you or within you, um, you know, can, can't entirely grasp it, but it comes. And if it comes from the land, it usually comes from a specific place in the land. You have to go there when it calls you. And then, then it will teach you something. This wisdom, this voice, or we hear it as a voice, so I guess it's a vibration of some sort. Um, you know, what, what is it? What is it really? Well, the various um, in, in philosophical traditions are various other names for this. Uh, the divine laws of the universe, the laws that underlie everything, bring everything into being and, and um, control how things evolve and manifest and take on different forms and change their forms and 
and the evolution of consciousness, all, all governed by these divine laws, which, which is, is the wisdom. Um, also, one can interpret it, and it is interpreted, this divine word, as the command. You know, it's, it's the will, the divine will. Um, let there be light. I mean, I love that expression in the Bible. It's not, um, make light. It's, you know, I read that as a poetic love statement of one aspect of divinity speaking to another as they're making love. Um, wouldn't it be a good idea to make some light? <laughs> <laughs> and wait for the response, you know. Here's the man asking, you know. <laughs> you know, dear, dear wouldn't, my beloved, wouldn't it be lovely to have a child? <laughs> and back comes the response, yes, you know, let's go for it. Hopefully that's the response. <laughs> and then you make your child. Let there be light. Light, the child, child manifests. So I see that's the poetic love story in, in the Bible. That's because um, I, I do believe the old it is an old teaching, but Jesus reiterates it for us all very clearly. Um, God is love. Um, what we call God is, is love, the principle of love. Um, get rid of the word God it causes so much muddles in people's mind. Just call it love. Love is the creative force, the underlying force of everything in the universe. It's the creative force and it's also that that which receives that creativity to give it a form. Um, in the wisdom traditions, the creative force of love um, is, is known, known as the wisdom. And the receptive, loving aspect, which receives that, like the seed that a man can sow in the woman's, woman's womb, um, is known as the divine intelligence, the mind of the universe, or, or matter. Um, receives this and gives, gives it a form. And our, our whole human life is like a kind of um, manifestation of that in, in our particular form. I guess other life forms do it in other ways, on other planets and stars. But we do it in a certain way on, on this planet, manifesting this creative idea of the two, two opposites that make the one. Uh, so there's a love relationship. And if you think about it, um, if everything is love, how do you express that love? Well, love can't express itself unless it's got the other to love. It must be the other. So within the one, there has to be a division, as it were, so that the one aspect can love the other aspect. So that's the other thing in the Bible I rather liked is in Solomon's wisdom, which says, all is vanity. Mm -hmm. you know, all is vanity. Well, the all is, is the one. But it loves itself, or it loves its other self, if you, if you see what I mean. All, all is vanity. So it's not meant as a cynic, cynical love, it's meant as a very sublime observation of what, what life really is. Um, but we, ha we have to appear separate to each other so we can love each other. If we all fused together totally, we couldn't express that love. And um, I find it's the same with the land. Um, you know, we're part of nature, and yet we seem also to be separate from other parts of nature that, not, that are not ourselves. And why? It's so that we can love each other, exchange, exchange that love in some sort of way. And um, if you take the love, that love, creativity, right through, it's not just um, a will, it's not just a desire, you know, let there be. It's actually the consciousness that lies behind that, or goes with it. You know, you've got, you've got to know what you desire, to some extent. Oh, well, maybe you don't always. But <laughs> you've got to have some sort of awareness, like, I want to do something. And then comes the action. So the whole, whole fulfillment of that, that will or desire, let there be, is, is ends up, or can be included in, in the total activity, the action. So as, as a great teacher for me was Francis Bacon, Sir Francis Bacon, not, not the philosopher, not the painter. And um, even though he lived 400 years ago, he, he took up that same theme, God is love, and developed that even further so that we could help us understand it, what does love mean. Um, and he, oh, I've gone blank, sorry, I get these, I'm still 
getting over chemo, so I get chemo, what's called chemo brain, I suddenly go blank, so you have to excuse me if, if that happens. Um, what, what was it coined? Um, Francis yeah, Francis Bacon, what does he say? Well, I, for, I forgot, never mind what he said. <laughs> 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 he, he was a wise guy. <laughs> Um, the things that, that really I, I was brought up um, a Christian but I don't call myself the, the, um, the religious type of Christian um, but I believe very much in, in what was taught through Jesus Christ which is also the Orphic teachings and the Orphic mysteries um, emphasising the divine being or divine whatever we want to call it is, is, is love, basically love um, so, so I always had a big Bible underneath my bed, the family Bible. And it's huge. It's about <laughs> that thick, <laughs> about that size, and full of these, these wonderful pictures. I love the pictures, you see. But there's a picture every page, a full, full page picture, and then you turn over the leaf and you get another one. And opposite it were, were the verses of the Bible. And I gradually worked myself through the Bible and then through it again and through it again. So I got to know it pretty well in my growing up times. And uh, really enjoyed various pieces of it. Um, and, and, and what I've already said is it's really caught my mind this poetry as it begins with, this po poetic love story. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said, let there be light, and there was light. It's a wonderful poetic description. The spirit moved on the waters. They've got this polarity, the two opposites. Um, in tradition, it gets humanized into father and mother. Father's the spirit, and the mother is the waters. Um, it's another name for the universal mind, or, or substance of the mind. Um, and then the father, the spirit, uh, asks, you know, let there be light, can there be light? And the mother responds, um, yes, there can be, and there was light. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. The mother enabled it to be. It needed the two, the two were essential uh, for this to happen, this wonderful light. Um, so you've got the wisdom, and you've got the intelligence, and together they make uh, the light, which in Freemasonry is called beauty. So in the Freemasonic teachings, they describe as wisdom to design, strength to support, beauty um, to adorn. Wisdom to design, strength to support, beauty to adorn. Strength there is an alternative name. It's a translation of the Hebrew. It's an alternative name for the divine intelligence. The strength. So think about yourselves. We... we all have an inner voice, which we could say is our voice of wisdom, if we care to listen to it. That inner voice of the intuition speaking to us. But that's no good without our intelligence. So welcome our intelligence. You know, the whole of us can be described as intelligent, not just up here in the, in the head. The whole of us is a living intelligence, the embodiment of the Divine Mother um, of, of the universe and the wisdom working, working with her, within us, speaking to us all the time. Um, and then if we get it right, we manifest light. We become light ourselves. We, we shine it out to others. Um, wonderful thing. The landscape can do exactly the same. So beauty, what's described in Freemasonry is beauty, and in, and in Hebrew Kabbalah, that's described as beauty. Uh, that beauty is essentially a description of light, spiritual light beautiful light, the light of love. The light of love is beauty, pure beauty. So when we describe each other as beautiful, or something about the landscape as beautiful, what is it we're describing? I'm sure you've all thought about that. It's not just the outer form, is it? It's something intangible inside. It's something that speaks to you or shines to you. It, it's you know, I think it's feelable. You know, you're in the presence of somebody who's truly beautiful, and you, you can feel it, even from afar. In the, in the landscape, it's beautiful. You, you feel it. And um, 
And of course, you know, we're all, all different too. So some people feel something's beautiful, somebody else finds it more difficult to feel it's beautiful. Um, so we respond to different types of light, as it were, that, that shine out. There are different types of light. There's a cool light, there's a warm light, there's a hot light, for instance. Um, there's magnetic light, there's a lightning light. There's, you know, you keep on describing. I don't think you ever studied light. You see the different types of light. And, um, and the same thing with, with heat, with warmth, which seems to go with light sometimes. I think you've probably found some different types of warmth. I didn't know this until we got Naga. <laughs> you know, I was very cynical about having an Naga as a cooker. Um, you know, it's, it's more expensive than a normal cooker. Um, very cynical. But once we started using it, we suddenly realized, my goodness, it's a different heat, different quality of heat that comes in comes into the cooking, so it tastes different. And, uh, me and Sarah, we think it tastes better than cooking in another sort of oven. But again, different people have different likes on this. Um, but essentially, it's this, this beauty um, that attracts us, and it's, it's intangible in a way. And yet, it, yet at the same time, it's kind of intangible. I, I mean, just going off, off uh, a bit of diversion moment, when I was in hospital recently, I was getting so many, so much prayer and love from everybody. It was absolutely, I can't say overwhelming. I wasn't overwhelmed by it. I was, I was astonished by it, that the magnificence of, of people's love, their, their ability to love and, um, and, and to care and so on, and the prayers that were sent out, and there was this, one moment, I mean, it went on for quite a time, but, but there's one particular moment, it was so tangible around me that this, I guess you couldn't see it, you couldn't hear it, well I couldn't, but it's like I could touch it somehow, so tangible, so absolutely real. Um, of course it wouldn't register in modern scientific experiments <laughs> at the moment, but one has to believe in it, I mean it's, it's a real such a real life experience. I'm sure you've all had something like this. Um, it's an amazing experience when love is expressed by anybody or when it's expressed by animals. I think flowers and, and other things express it too, have the capacity for it. But human beings have an enormous capacity to express this love, this, this wisdom of the universe, this wisdom and intelligence, the beauty, beauty of life. Um, there are various myths which are quite good at explaining this, with wisdom myths. Uh, one, of the, one of them I like is from the um, Hindu tradition or Vedic tradition. And so it, it, it calls the creative uh, voice, the creative wisdom, Brahma. And that which gives it form, the, the feminine aspect which gives it form, is called Sarasvati, Brahma and Sarasvati. Uh, Sarasvati is the goddess that gives form to the vibration of the wisdom. And so she's known as the, the, the goddess of, um, of, of language, um, of poetry, philosophy, all the arts, and so on. Everything that gives beautiful form um, to, to that, that wisdom. Sarasvati includes dance and other things like that, you know. That, one can dance beautifully, you know. And my wife's very good at this. <laughs> so I love, I'm not such a good dancer, but I love watching. Where's Sarah? She could, I'll embarrass her. Because <laughs> I like watching her dance. And I, I like watching other people, and they dance beautifully. I, I'm sure we all do. And um, I enjoy dancing myself. So. <laughs> well, the Brahma and Sarasvati, their, their child, as it were, equivalent of light, it is it's, um, known as Hamsa. Hamsa. And Hamsa is described as a swan. You know, symbolic form, swan. Swan, the Hamsa swan. Uh, which is a symbol of the great poet, a symbol of beauty, pure beauty, a symbol of the rising up to the highest consciousness and culture um, possible. Hamsa, the swan. Um, 
But Hamsa, if you go deeper into the story, Hamsa is originally twins, Ham and Sar. And they didn't get on with each other very well. <laughs> they used to fight a bit. But eventually they found a friendship between themselves. The fighting stopped. They made peace. And they started to love each other. And eventually they loved each other so much they fused together as one and made the Hamsa swan. It's the same story that we, we have in our um, classical tradition from Greek myth of Leda and the swan. Um, they're two swans, but the, there the, the swan as such is Zeus, and Leda is, is the goddess. Um, so Zeus is the same as Brahma, and Leda is the same as Sarasvati. And they give birth to the Gemini, the, the, the twins. Sometimes they're described as just the two brothers, one mortal and one immortal. Um, sometimes it's two pairs of twins, two immortals, uh, brother and sister, and two mortals, brother and sister. Um, so it gives that idea of the polarity through the immortal ones and the mortal one. And this, this I find, is how the wisdom manifests in ourselves, manifests in the landscape. Um, you know, we, we usually identify ourselves living on Earth as mortals. But sure as anything, we have an immortal part of us. We have our twin, we have our Gemini. Um, we might be the hand, and our Sar is the universe. You know? And so this lovely, lovely breathing technique, you, you breathe in, Ham, I am. Sar, that, I am. That, which is what Hamsa means, literally translated. Ham, sa, breathe in, breathe out. And eventually, if you start to do that, it's a sort of yogic breathing, then uh, you suddenly find you can't tell the difference between Ham and Sa, between yourself and the universal self. You, you become fused as one in, in love, in, in, a, in a consciousness of love. Um, so I, find, I find that a beautiful teaching about this. One can understand that you might breathe in the wisdom into your intelligence, and then you breathe out again, beauty. Breathe in, breathe out. So I'm creating light all the time um, as we do this. Higher self and the lower self. One can also describe that as above and below in the Hermetic teachings. To do the great work in the Hermetic teachings, you have to join together uh, the above and the below, the heaven and the earth. They have to somehow come together in that love relationship, fuse, fuse it together. You can also describe it as inside, outside, the inner and the outer. Um, or myself and yourself. Or in theatre, the, the actors and the audience. You know, when there's a, a real thrill of love relationship of some sort between the audience and the actors. You know, the audience really love the play, they love the performance. And the, the, the actors will get that, they'll get that feedback from the audience, they'll, so they'll act better. It brings out the best in, in both, and suddenly you get this magic happen. Have you all been to the theatre? Hopefully you've experienced that. I mean, sometimes theatre can be deadly dull, but, but once that that rapport between audience and actors is that you get that sudden magic, uh, which, is, which is pure light, pure expression of love and, and beauty. Um, and then when you come to uh, talk about the form of things, you have the outer form and the inner form, and have it with us, and you have it with the landscape. Um, and so on. The, the landscape has the outer form and it also has the inner form, has the mortal aspect, has the immortal aspect. Um, the immortal is sometimes called uh, the archetypes on which everything else is based. Uh, Plato called the archetypes the living ideas of God, which is another way of looking at living ideas of God. Uh, the immortal aspect brings and it marries the mortal aspect and both are actually one they just appear to be divided 
<coughs> as opposite of, of, of a unity, of a oneness. Um, I never got along with the, some sort of belief that um, it's associated with the Cathars, although I don't believe the Cathars did, believe, did think this, it's associated with the Cathars and others that this, this world, this physical world and so on, is a terrible world and we need to get away from it as far as we can. Right? The physical world, the physical body only, and our physical experiences are absolutely precious to us. It gives us this wonderful chance to love each other, love the land, in sometimes the most difficult of circumstances. I mean, it's easy to love when you're in wonderful surroundings and everything's just right for you, but when it becomes more difficult, it's a challenge. But if you can love in all the challenges, what a huge love you're expressing. Fantastic. And I, th I think now, you know, the challenge the Europeans have got with this huge wave of refugees coming, and of course it throws up lots of fears in people here, um, and it's easy to be welcoming to them to start, but once you get so many you don't know how to cope with it, then suddenly your fears come up and you want to protect what you've got already. And you start being, stop being friendly. You know, that's, that's a challenge to Europeans because it's such a huge mass of people um, coming over. Um, how, how do we look after them in a loving, loving way? How to greet them in a loving way? Well, we need wisdom. Can't do it well without the wisdom and the intelligence. And that, that of course, is the challenge to every single European governments and every single European community. How do we develop the wisdom and intelligence to deal with this in a, in a, in a loving way? That's, that's good for everybody. Huge, huge lesson, huge challenge. But if we, if we get it, if we get it right, Europe could become a huge, huge star for the whole shining star of beauty for the whole planet. It'd be fantastic if we get it right. So I'm, I'm hoping. Fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, it's, it's worth, I've, I've thought about it, what happens if suddenly, you know, if refugees turned up at your doorstep, uh, what would you do? Well, I, I thought, well, if one or two turned up, I'd be able to say, come on in, you know, make you at home, give you a meal, there's a bed here, and sleep in, and so on, and try and help you onto your feet. Um, but if I had 50 turned up, I wouldn't know what to do. You know, that's the challenge, isn't it? And so that's what people are very frightened of. But that, we can't deal with it as individuals. We can only deal with it as a complete society. Um, where to house them, uh, where to put them in the landscape if we're in a land that's very crowded. You know, where do they go? What, what's the appropriate place? What's, what's the wise place? Um, Well, the wisdom, the wisdom I find expresses itself um, in the behaviour we have. Our process of life is designed according to wisdom. Um, I think I've come to know a certain bit of it, but that's, that's because it's also found in the wisdom teaching which are passed on. So all I can say is I've, I've, been fa I've discovered what I think is that wisdom thanks to these great traditions. That, that all have to be understood and interpreted, but um, you know, I can only say thank you to all my ancestors, going back and back and back in time, who found the same thing and passed on this wisdom. But it's up to each of us to test, test out what we're taught, of course, or what we discover. We, we need to test it out. So I've tested it out over a long period of time, and I still find this teaching to be true. So there is a fundamental law or wisdom behind our process of life we go through, which when we do it well becomes initiation, <coughs> um, which could be described as three great steps we have to make, learn to love, learn to understand, and learn to serve. Um, three great steps of initiation, and then we create light, we create beauty that, that, that is light. Um, and part of our more mortal self becomes immortal um, in, in doing that. Um, I also find that wisdom exists in these archetypal patterns that underlie, underlie all four. And uh, the three that I can recognise as the three <laughs> essential archetypal patterns is the circle, 
also known as the wheel of life, because when it's the divine geometry isn't just a static thing, it's a living thing. You know, it's movement, it's energy, energized. So it's, it's a wheel of life, what's called in tradition, a wheel of life. Well, the Sanskrit for wheel of life is, is chakra, and the Greek for wheel of life is zodiac. Zodiac means a wheel of life. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean what most people think. It's the it's, um, circle of the heavens divided into 12 equal parts, um, and each part called after a constellation. That's just one of the many geometries that the circle could be, can be divided into. The zodiac means a wheel of life. You have 12 divisions, you have 8 divisions, you have 4 divisions, 5 divisions, you know, it doesn't matter, geometry can vary. Uh, but essentially it's a wheel of life, it's moving, it's spinning. And that's the same as a chakra. A chakra is, is the same, same name. Most people come to understand chakras through the Eastern tradition, also over here taught us, um, and it relates to our body. We have it said we have seven major chakras. We do have seven major chakras. Some of us can see them, and um, great bra uh, crown, brow, throat, heart, solar plexus, sacral root chakras is some English names for them. Um, but that's a system of chakras, a system of wheels of life. But they all summed up in one big wheel. Each of us is one huge wheel of life or chakra going around. And our, our, our um, challenge is to make that wheel or chakra that we are um, a sphere of light, a shining sun of light. Create, create the golden body, the golden, the golden soul, the golden self, the sun self. So then we become sun beings walking on this earth. As some have done in the past, um, and so you've got you've got the chakra, you've got the chakra system. Two two key archetypes. The third key archetype that goes with it to make a trinity is what's called in the Hebrew, uh, now Christian tradition, the, the tree of life. Um, so that 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 could be described as a pattern of how the centres of the chakra system join up with each other and extend that chakra system bit wider and then you get the complete tree of life pattern. Just one way of describing it. The tree of life are the link that's really taking into account the links between the centre of each circle or, or chapter. <coughs> now I, I as I said right at the start of the talk, I found I was seeing some of this in, in the landscape. Just just like that. I just went out, it was like a gift from God. <laughs> Suddenly I could see it. Then it's taken me years and years of research and so on to understand it, work with it, and, and um, see how, how to help help things with it. So I'm going to show some slides, I hope. And this is one, you know, naturally being a British, British born. I'm very glad I am. I'm not trying to say it's not nice to be born somewhere else, but for me, for my life's work, it's, I'm very, very happy to be born in prison. <laughs> I mean, others get born somewhere else and then they feel they don't belong and have to move. I haven't, haven't had that experience. But um, so I've, I've, got to, I've got to love my country very much. Now, Britain was originally the British Isles. And this, this is a name that's difficult to use nowadays because people have different concepts about it. <coughs> But it's one of the oldest names for the British Isles. Then eventually it became associated with just what we call Great Britain, England, Wales, and Scotland. Then, then <coughs> later, with the Roman times, Romans called the Scottish part Caledonia. And so Britain became what we know as Roman Britain. Well, I found in the whole of the British Isles, there are three great centres that were recognised in the past and still there to be found and working. Well, each has a huge, huge angel attached to it. The angel, I find, is another form of that divine wisdom, another, another form given by the holy intelligence to, to that wisdom that can manifest as the angel in the landscape. And um, let's use a pointer here. The, the, the centre of Roman Britain is, is High Cross, just north east of Coventry. Um, it's on the A5, and 
centre of Arla is Ushna, a place called Ushna, um, where there's always used to, in Celtic times, a sacred fire was always kept burning there. And the May Day, big May Day festival held there every year, where the fires of the high kings and the kings elsewhere were all relit every year at the Ushna fire. And we, we've, we've worked a long time with, with Irish people in Ireland to try and, and, and the farmer who owns Ushna Hill to try and get the May Day festival going again, the fire lit again on the hill. And it's been happening for the last four or five years now. So that's, that's been a success story. <laughs> Still has its complications because there are lots of egos come into play <laughs> which <Yeah>. clash. <laughs> but it, 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 it's lit. Lit. Last Four or five years have been lit, still being lit every year. Um, Dunsinan is the Scottish centre. This, this is more hidden, not known, but I, I was drawn to it through the Shakespeare story of Macbeth. Why, why did such a lot of hidden wisdom in Shakespeare? And they're often pointers to a treasure trail, you know, treasure trail of wisdom, and, and has to do with the landscape as much as with the human mind. And um, so I was alerted by Shakespeare using that old Scottish story of Macbeth and the Burnham Wood that comes to Macbeth's castle at Dunsin and and, I, and, um, and one, one way of interpreting that play is it's a, it's a play, if you like a cynical play, um, on what, what is sacred kingship, you know, what, 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 is, what does it mean to have the divine right of being king. It was written at the time for King James I of England, sixth of Scotland, who was all into being, ha you know, having the divine right and so on. <laughs> anyway, so, so you could see the play as talking about what's it mean, the sanctity of kings and so on. And therefore, the centre done sinner must be the sacred centre of Scotland being identified. So we. we went and looked at it, but then when I drew it on the map, found with the other two centres, made this perfect equilateral triangle. And um, each centre had its own angel that covered a great circle of its aura, its wings, if you like. And the circles touching each other, of course, which they do with a, a, a sorry, equilateral triangle. And that, that's, I haven't found that anywhere else in the world. It might, might exist elsewhere in the world, but at the moment, as far as I can see, it's unique, pretty unique and pretty wonderful. And no wonder these islands are sometimes referred to the <laughs> islands of the Triple Goddess, the sacred islands, <coughs> the Isles of the Three Marys, because uh, Mary is, is associated with this land. That, that's why you get Robin Hood and the Merry Men. Merry Men means Mary's Men. And, um, and always the Roman Catholic tradition has still said that, that Britain is the dowry of the Virgin Mary. Um, it's her kingdom, her land. So the, these are three sacred isles of tradition. Uh, the Isles of the North, the Isles of the North, which were also called Hyperborea, the land beyond the north wind. That's where the north wind comes from, the land in the north, the sacred isles of the north, where the hidden, hidden mysteries are. The north, north wind is associated with the, um, in Greek myth, it's, it's the creative breath, the Holy Spirit, the creative breath of God. And it comes, comes into our body through what's called the outer major chakra at the back of the neck. Holy breath, breathe, breathed into us. Our physical breath is like the, the echo, echo or mirror image, if you like, of, of the spiritual breath comes in through the outer nature chakra, the back of the neck, inspires the heart, and then from the heart, the wisdom in it then speaks through the throat to your mind, um, that, that part of the mind focuses in the head, um, as, as the intuition, intuitive voice. But first inspired through the outer major chakra. The outer major chakra also, the one behind the back of the neck, is actually located in the centre of the brainstem. Um, so it, it, it's, it's like supported by the Atlas bone. And, and in, in Greek myth, the, the Atlas raises up and supports the Pleiades, uh, his daughters, 
on, on his shoulders, on, on the back of his neck, if you like. That, that's, that's in the story of Atlantis, that, that um, Atlas raises up his daughters from the flood um, on, on the back of his neck, on his shoulders. And, um, and the Pleiades is, is associated, as, as you know, associated with Taurus in the sky. And Taurus rules the throat chakra, the, the whole throat of our body. And the throat is what sounds the word, speaks the wisdom of the word. Uh, we hear the wisdom within, and we can speak it outwardly. When, when we can speak outwardly, what we hear inwardly is the wisdom perfectly, then we're, we're doing very well. <laughs> uh, so so the, the Taurus thing is important. The Pleiades is, is a symbol of the outer major chakra, but, but the throat is associated with. And when they work together, they speak the word. So in Greek myth, their, their child is known as Mercury. Mercury is from an old word, mal keru, which means the true word. You speak the true word. Mercury means the true word, the living word of God. Um, so one can see that following this through, I'm just trying to give you a quick synopsis, really. following this through, you can see this, these lands, these sacred lands, is forming the outer major chakra of the whole planet. Um, that's, that's just the chakra system we're working with at the moment, at the British Isles. That goes up through, that's, a, that's a, the whole chakra system of all three lands together. Um, this, this is a zodiac we've been exploring um, of Britain, Roman Britain parts, which I, I found that uh, Francis Bacon and his Rosicrucian group used, they knew about it and they used and it forms a basis underlying some of the Shakespeare work and so on, which is why Shakespeare had to become the sweet swan of Avon's in the Cygnus area of the British Zodiac. So Stratford, where um, the actor came from, was a key place, so the actor had to play a key part in this whole thing in order to make this, this thing work. Bacon himself came from um, his, his home, St Albans, in the Firecus of the 13th sign which is the seat in the, in the round table story, that's the seat that the heir to the throne sits on. The prince, the heir to the throne, sits on that. So there, there lies another actual historical secret um, of, of those days of Francis Bacon and Rosicrucians and Shakespeare. And, and that, that's extraordinary. You know, the stars at the time, um, 1602, 1604, um, there were two supernovas appeared in the sky, one, one in Cygnus and one, one in, in the Firecus. And um, this was taken as sign by the Rosicrucians to make their work public. And it's just extraordinary because these two centres have already been chosen um, by that Rosicrucian group. It's just amazing, isn't it? Yeah. So, so who makes what happen? <laughs> you know? Do we manifest supernovas <laughs> in our consciousness, or does it go to a divine plan where we're just actors on the stage of the world, as, as um, Shakespeare said? And um, oh, there's lots of so many secrets in this. It's, it's, this, is, this is a fantastic zodiac um, wheel of life with my book, The Twelve Signs, in this, from what my research is how it goes. And, um, it's a big, big story to go into all that. But it's a very great story. You, you probably already gather that the land itself is the round table of the myth. And it's known as the gift that Merlin gave um, when Arthur married Guinevere. He gave the round table as the diary gift. He gave us the diary to Guinevere so that then she was the queen to marry the, the man who would then be made king by marrying her. The man had to marry the right woman in those days because <laughs> she came with the land. <laughs> she came with the dowry. Um, so that this is the round table, the thirteenth seat of it. London, London is, asso is associated with the part that's. If you look up in the sky, that's where the centre of the Milky Way galaxy is at that point. Um, so I talked about this a lot before. So I'll move on. Quickly, oh, I haven't got much time left, but um, 
that this, this I want to point out to you, you can then carry on researching it after I point it out to you. It was pointed out to me, again in researches into the whole Bacon story, I didn't know this before, but this in the sky, this shape is known as the Masonic compass, or the divine compass, the same sort of thing painted in, in, the, in, in the medieval days. You saw God holding a compass and laying out the whole universe with that compass. So th this is the compass in the sky, symbolically speaking. Uh, one point on the heart of Leo, star Regulus, and one point on the star Speaker, which is the ear of corn, representing the child of Virgo, the Virgin. And then the top point, the apex point, is, goes to the star Deneb in Cygnus the Swan. And that, that Cygnus the Swan represents that hand of God that, that is turning the compass, creating everything. So that Cygnus is a key, absolute, in the whole zodiac, Cygnus is probably one of the most key constellations of all, key positions, if you like, um, in the zodiac. Because that, from that, whole of that universe, that particular universe in that wheel of life is laid out and and kept an eye on, really. <laughs> and, it, and it's associated with raising consciousness, associated with a great poet. The poet, the great poet in the old days used to be known as the creator. If you're a really genuine poet, a good poet, you speak in such a way that it creates, it creates, and it, and it, it lifts consciousness um, to greater levels and so on. Um, sign the great poet, Sweet Swan and Avon centred there at that apex. And the nearest um, town to that is Stratford upon Avon. Mm -hmm. So you can see two reasons, two big reasons why it's important to focus the Shakespeare theatre there, which brings pilgrims from all over the world, Pil Shakespeare pilgrims from all over the world, thousands of them every year coming to this spot on earth to enjoy that poetry and culture and the wisdom that lies within it. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> <laughs> what a great inspiration those Rosicrucians had in, in those days 400 years ago. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that. And somehow we were asked to maintain this. We need to keep this whole story going. It's so important for the world. On a bigger scale, which I haven't got a picture but as such, a similar picture, but on, on a bigger scale, this forms the inner face, the, the inner part of one face of a planetary dodecahedron. Another point of that geometry is on, exactly on the North Pole star. So it's a key planetary, it's the key part, key face, key inner face of a very important planetary dodecahedron. The dodecahedron is a symbol of the etheric body of the planet, and, and ether is that substance, the quintessence, that can be turned into light, can become light. And often when we see ley lines and so on and see them as lines of light, they're not all lines of light, when you see one that's a line of light, you know that there's love being put into it all the time. Uh, it's love energising it, so it's turned this fantastic geometric, ge geometry, geometric pattern in, into light. So it's a key to turning turning our world into, into a body of life. And the, the wisdom holders knew these things and worked with it. This is the Zodiac Barland. Very, very quick. We've just recently been there to do some more research on the, the south to north, north-south line. We've worked for years on the east-west line, going from uh, Dublin to Crowpatrick. Crowpatrick being uh, in being associated with the belt of Orion, and Dublin being associated with the centre of the galaxy, like London is in the British zodiac. Um, there's ocean at the centre. Well, we, we were called to work on the north-south line, which is very interesting, because it starts, it's actually this red line, and it starts at the place where the first Christian um, monk, a missionary, came, came to Ireland to bring Christianity to Ireland. It wasn't St. Patrick. Mm. It was somebody called St. Declan. He came a bit before St. Patrick. Have I got the name right, sir? Yeah. 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 
and, and he arrived and he realised he'd forgotten his bell, so his bell floated over on a rock <laughs> to join him. Well, that, that hides a, a deeper tradition. He, he set up his centre here as, as a place of baptism on the coast of Ireland there. And it's still a big centre of pilgrimage. Um, St. Patrick's most associated with his huge pilgrimage from east to west along this axis, ending up on Crow Patrick, where he meditated and prayed for 40 days and night um, in order, before Easter um, in order to cast out evil thought forms um, out of Ireland. Because at, at that time, they were um, the, the sort of religion they had, they, they were uh, sacrificing young children and so on. So St. Patrick was concerned to try to stamp that out somehow. And the key to it is to, is to find the source, not treat the symptom, but treat the source of it. And so he, he did this wonderful 40 days and nights after a big ceremonial pilgrimage along this axis that has a chakra system, ending up. And he, he came along that with the High King and the other kings of Ireland and all their followers and so on. A big ceremonial pilgrimage. It took days to do that. And then he ended up 40 days and nights um, on the top of the mountain doing this meditation of, and prayer and it said then that he cast he did manage to cast out the evil thought forms and certainly it, from Irish history it did transform itself and then on um, well the thought forms that came turned into uh, black birds and the black birds were later changed into snakes and now it's said in tradition he cast out the snakes from Ireland but that's you know it's only a symbol it's a symbol of these nasty thoughts that people were having, mistaken thoughts. Um, but that actually, I put it to you, is one way of working with, with the landscape in, in a very serious way and a knowledgeable way, um, and, and a way that causes no hurt, no harm to anybody, um, to change the thinking that is causing cruelty elsewhere in the world. I think of many places where there's terrible cruelty going on because of the terrible thinking that certain people have. So if one could just change that in this sort of way St. Patrick did, wouldn't that be wonderful? Mm -hmm. Well, we can do it. We can do it, you know. But we have to, we have, to have the knowledge. We have to develop the knowledge, the wisdom, and um, experiment a bit, and then, then we'll be able to do it well in the right place at the right time. Um, well, going on with the story, um, St. Columba, the third great saint of, associated with Ireland, he set, he set out for Iona from this north point, which is Derry, or London Derry. He, he lived there with his monks for about 12 years, and then when he was ready, sailed from there northwards. So you've got these three, three great um, Celtic saints. St. Patrick's a Celtic saint. Um, Columba's a Celtic saint. So they were, you know, in the, in the language of the day, they were known as Druids. And St. Declan, he was a Celtic saint from Wales. He came to Ireland. So you've got St. Declan, St. Patrick, St. Columba, you could say, forming along this north-south line. I thought that thought was quite neat how <laughs> that worked out. Um, and in Scotland, that's a bit complicated, but we, we, we've been working for a long time with Iona, knowing that was quite serious. And we just had a recently had a retreat week there, and we're going to go again in, in um, not next year, but the year after. We booked the hotel for another retreat there. If anyone's interested in that, it's, it's a wonderful place to be and uh, to have a spiritual retreat and, and work with the landscape and, and the angels. And, and there's Dun Sin at the centre. And then Europe we worked with as a whole and working with the myth of Europa and the bull. There's Europa, British Isles. And this is the chakras of the bull of Europe. You can see the bull, it's curved back, it's head down, charging as it were, and that, that's its head. And its horns with the energy of the crown chakra, symbolised by the horns as it were, coming out of Santiago de Compostela. So the great pilgrimage route of old is from what used to be called Constantinople, now Istanbul, along this route, and ending up at Santiago. 
and, and, uh, and along it form these, these main chakras of the ball. So we worked with that for some time. And still, still are working with it. And then we found that this, what we call, what I call the Grail Kingdom, because it's the whole of this area is associated with the, uh, the Grail myths. Uh, the major Grail myths are all, all in Britain. But then the extended myths take in right up into Scotland and right down into the south of France and a bit into Spain and, and a bit into um, the, the, the Italian Alps. So I, I call that chakra system the, the Grail land. And it looks to me, whether it's true or not, it looks to me like the child of the Europa and the Bull. In other words, it's Mercury. It's sounding the word of God. It's got the wisdom in it. It's radiating out this wisdom. I think it's a terribly important uh, landscape temple. So um, I'm getting on in years now. So it's, and I, you know, I've been hoping to get a lot of people involved with this. So to carry on, to carry on, to build up that people keep visiting these places in, in the right consciousness, the right way, putting love into it and, and um, linking chakras together, making, making it shine for the world, shine for Europe, shine for the world. Mercury, the, the voice, if you like, of Europe in terms of, in terms of the landscape. Um, then the other landscape temple we found is along what we originally called the heart line of Europe, because it goes through Constance, the heart, heart of Europe, heart of the bull chakras as well. And then we one day found, oh, it's using the bull chakras, seeing those as the wings, here you've got the swan of Europe, you've got the story of Leda and the swan. Because Leda and the swan is also associated with the throat, throat area, with, with speaking, with culture, poetry, raising consciousness to the heights. And, and this, later, of course, is St. Europa, British Isles. And, and she's, that, that's the swan part. And what, that this make, it makes across over Europe, those two chakra systems, the Leda chakra system and the bull chakra system. Sorry, the swan chakra system, the bull chakra system. And they make make the cross, and one can find another wisdom there. The, the ball is what ploughs the land, so is the sea, and it's associated with bringing justice to the world. And, and you can't build a civilization without justice, without good laws. You can't do anything else. You can't develop any culture without that basic groundwork of good laws. Once you've got that groundwork, then you can bring in the swan consciousness, which is to do with the culture, raising your culture upon that, and Raise it going, going higher and higher. So you've got the, the ball, the justice, the horizontal, if you like, and you've got the vertical, the swan, which is the soaring consciousness into higher and higher culture. We need, we need those two things. You need the ball, you need the swan uh, to develop society to its civilization to its highest point. And the child of both of them is probably the Grail Kingdom. Well, I don't know, that's a question. Um, this is the other dodecahedron, um, it's centred on Bourges, which is the Hara centre of the Grail Kingdom. And so that's the inner part of the face of another dodecahedron. So I think the two dodecahedrons, one centred on Bourges and the other one centred on High Cross in Brittany, I think these two dodecahedrons are like manifesting the polarity idea, that the male-female, if you like. And if you work with both, fuse both together in love, you'll get an amazing expression of, of love and light, of beauty. That's my belief. That, that's shaped on a bigger scale over the whole world. I think these, these are secrets. We're, we're being allowed to find these things now uh, if you like, as pioneers, I think people knew about these things in the past. I know they did. But then knowledge got lost. We're being allowed to rediscover it again um, in a new way, and extra things on top of it, uh, to build, build the future. The future will be a golden age. Once we're through all this struggle and devastations and so on, we'll be able to build 
we we'll be able to have a golden age. We we'll be able to build it. And, and I think doing this sort of work is part of the building of it. But then um, this, this is how I found the chakras of the planet. So there you see the, the throat chakra is Europe, and here I've drawn northern, northern Africa too as part of it. Um, the zodiac goes with the chakra system like this. So Taurus rules the throat. Gemini is at the shoulder, shoulders and that lower part of the throat. Um, the heart area uh, is symbolized by Leo and Cancer, zodiac wise. And that encompasses the um, Indian subcontinent and so on all the way through. So we've been working with that for some time. But you can see there, British Isles, the outer major chakra, Hyperborea, the land of the north. Um, absolutely key to the, for the whole world, in fact. They were the sacred isles of old. It's where the wisdom is said to have been first anchored on this planet um, a long, long time ago, millions of years ago. Um, some, some great teachers give the exact figure. Um, anchored there by the, the godmen came from the other stars and so on to this planet to anchor it here on Earth so that humanity could develop and, and, and gradually discover the wisdom and start to manifest it ourselves. Um, and of course it would be the right place to come on earth because it's the outer major chakra, that's where the wisdom first comes, first inspired to us via that gateway and then spreads to the rest of the body. I, th I think this, this is my understanding of it all. This is my belief. My understanding, of course, is, is um, only so much. We've got to gradually expand it bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and so these are just a few things discovered, I hope, will be helpful for all of us as we go on. Thank you. Thank you. Very much, Peter. I didn't. I didn't want to get up and stop those jewels of wisdom. That's absolutely fascinating.